This module aims at discussing transaction cost theory of firm. After learning this module, you will be able to understand assumptions of the TCT, human and human behavior, environmental characteristics, background and evolution of TCT, transaction cost, governance, choice and contract, adaptation, efficiency and the governance model. The transaction cost theory or TCT is also known as transaction cost economics or TCE that has been facilitating the firms in analysis and examination of a number of strategic and organizational issues. The TCT has helped a lot to strategic management in providing support of explanation of how firms internationalize the transaction cost. In addition, the TCT has also facilitated international business in supporting explanation of how firms internationalize the transaction cost. Ronald Harry Coase, the recipient of 1991 Nobel Prize, have advocated that while using market in number of transaction costs involved. Many times the cost of obtaining a good while using market exceeds the price of the good. While buying something from another party in the market, other costs such as search and information cost, keeping trade secrets, policing and enforcement cost and bargaining cost possibly increase the cost of the goods. This suggests that firms can internalize transaction cost of the production of goods and services in order to deliver a product. This insight shows the way for the latter development by Oliver Eaton Williamson, winner of the 2009 Nobel Prize, who advocated that markets and hierarchies are alternative coordination mechanisms for economic transactions. He has advocated that hierarchical organizations such as companies represent alternative governance structures which differ in their approaches to resolving conflicts of interest. Now let us discuss about the assumption of TCT. According to Williamson, TCT is based upon several key assumptions about human behavior and the environmental characteristics. In order to minimize transaction and production cost, the firm will select the governance from various alternatives available in the organizational menu. The first is human and human behavior. The most two important assumptions that are discussed here is opportunism with guile and bounded rationality. There are major human behavior advocated by Williamson as an assumption of TCT. This is opportunism with guile. Humans are advocated as self-interested individuals who pursue their own self-interest in their own activities. Individuals behave which is both subly and overtly fraudulent ex ante and ex post to agreeing on contracts. In fact, some individuals behave opportunistically that there are costs to exchange. According to Williamson, the opportunism assumption is about the motivations of human behavior. He considers this assumption as central to TCT because in the absence of potentially opportunistic behaviors, contracts would be costlessly enforced. The second is bounded rationality. Neoclassical theory assumes that individuals try to maximize utility and have perfect information with calculative rationality. However, Williamson assumes that the humans are boundedly rational. Individuals are intendedly rational, but only limitedly so. As per bounded rationality principle, individuals cannot process large degree of information. Individuals unable to assign probability value to the occurrence of future events. Bounded rationality does not indicate that individuals pursue irrational. They pursue with rational decisions, but within the limits of their imperfect cognitive abilities and information. Thus, 
the TCT assume that humans are boundedly rational. The second one is environmental characteristics. Asset specificity, uncertainty and frequency of the transactions are some of the major assumptions under environmental characteristics. These assumptions can be explained here. First is asset specificity. Asset specificity deliberates the extent to which an asset can be redeployed to alternative users and by alternative users without sacrifice of productive value. Williamson defined asset specificity as durable investments that are undertaken in support of particular transactions, the opportunity cost of which investment is much lower in best alternative uses or by the alternative users should the original transaction be prematurely terminated. He focuses on asset specific investment as a condition of small members because asset specific investments have little value outside of a particular relationship. Therefore, the transaction partners according to Williamson should continue the relationship even when contractual environments change. Williamson describes the process of transformation from large number to small numbers and advocated that although a large numbers exchange condition obtains at the outset, it is transformed during contract execution into a small numbers exchange relation on account of idiosyncratic experience associated with contract execution and failures in the human and non-human capital markets. Williamson distinguishes six different types of asset specificity reported in table 1. Uncertainty. Williamson assumes that information about past, present and future states are not perfectly known for various reasons which are in contrast with the perfect information assumption of the neoclassical view. Uncertainty arises because future states are unknown and it is not possible to determine who is more prone to behave opportunistically. Number three, frequency of the transaction. Williamson assumes that transactions should be frequent. If transactions are not frequent, then according to Williamson, the cost of alternative governance structure may not be justified. A larger and more frequency of transactions lead to justification for alternative governance structures. Thus, the frequency of transactions with respect to volume, number and temporal spread are very much important. The fourth is background and evolution of TCT. This module based upon above assumptions describes the fundamental idea of transaction cost economics that is TCE or the transaction cost theory that is TCT. The insight of which is obtained from the work of Ronald Coase, Oliver E. Williamson and Stephen Tredlis. TCT initially emerged in the 1970s as a framework which facilitate in analyzing how the governance of economic organization affects economic value. As such, according to Oliver E. Williamson and Stephen Tedley's, TCT is a part of broader effort to study the economics of organization which includes agency, mechanism design theory, team theory, property rights theory and the resource based competency theories. Renault Coase, best known as the forefather of transaction cost theory, first observed the transaction cost in 1937 that arise when transactions are conducted through the market. The fundamental insight which help him to receive the Nobel Prize is that decision makers are situated at a boundary where using a Plato efficiency approach they have to constantly compare the transaction cost of using the market against those of managing exchanges internally. He had a view that internalizing the transactions optimizes the relative value of the exchange. The price mechanism 
observed in the market is replaced by agreement. According to Jones, the value added from internalization is relative efficiency, that is the cost of conducting transactions through the market versus the relative cost of internalizing them. There are though transaction cost related to internalization, they are relatively lower relative to those which help the exchanges in the market. Although Coase in his work explains why economic activity was organized within firms, since the works of Williamson, the TCT has moved to concerns with issues such as appropriation, ownership, alignment of incentives, and self-interest, which makes it a general and universally accepted theory. Now coming to the transaction cost. Many transactions according to Oliver E. Williamson and Stephen Treadley's require parties to engage in a relationship over which ongoing interaction is needed to complete the transaction. John R. Commons have a view that beyond simple market exchange like exchanging nuts for berries on the edge of the forest or buying a can of coke at a vending machine, the continuity of an exchange relationship was often important and the ultimate unit of activity must contain in itself the three principles of conflict, mutuality and order. Oliver E. Williamson and Stephen Dudley's have advocated that TCE follows commons in that governance is chosen in a cost effective degree to infuse order thereby to mitigate conflict and realize mutual gain. And the transaction is made the basic unit of analysis. Ken Thero in 1969 advocated a need to make a place for positive transaction costs both with respect to market failures and in conjunction with intermediate product market contracting. He opined that the cost of operating competitive markets are not zero as is usually assumed in a theoretical analysis. However, considering positive transaction cost introduced three basic problems. The first one is upon opening the black box of firm and market organization and looking inside, the black box turned out to be the Pandora's box, positive transaction costs were perceived to be everywhere. Number two is that transaction costs take on comparative institutional significance only as they can be shown to differ among modes of governance, say as between markets and the hierarchies. Transaction cost that pass the test of comparative contractual significance need to be embedded in a conceptual framework from which predictions can be derived and empirically tested. The second is governance, choice and contract. There is a distinction observed by James Buchanan between lens of choice and lens of contract approaches to economic organization. James Buchanan argued that economics as a discipline went wrong in its preoccupation with the science of choice and the optimization apparatus associated therewith. Thus, according to Oliver E. Williamson and Stephen Tedelis, in order to analyze the inner working of institutions such as markets and hierarchies, the orthodox lens of choice, that is the resource allocation paradigm, with emphasis on prices and output supply and demand would need to give way to the evolving lens of contract. Upon examining governance and organization through the lens of contract, Oliver E. Williamson and Stephen Tedelis argued that the firm was no longer a black box for transforming inputs into output according to the laws of technology but was interpreted instead as an alternative mode of contracting. Adaptation. Economic problems arise due to change. Hardly economic organizations quickly adopt such kind of change. Thus, rapid adaptation to the particular circumstances of spatial and temporal change is taken to be the main problem of economic organization. In fact, adaptation is the central problem of organization and according to 
Bernard and Haig, there are different types of adaptation. Haig focused on the adaptations of autonomous economic actors who adjusted spontaneously to changes in the market, mainly as signaled by changes in relative prices. But Bernard featured coordinated adaptation among economic actors working through administration. In his view, the marvel of hierarchy is that coordinated adaptation accomplished not spontaneously but in a conscious, deliberate, purposeful way through administration. TCT as per view of Tedelis and Williamson conquers that adaptation is the central problem of economic organization and makes provision for adaptation of both autonomous and coordinated kinds. Further, Tedelis and Williamson opined the marvel of the market and the marvel of hierarchy are now therefore joined. The upshot is that the problem of economic organization is properly posed not in terms of the old ideological divide of markets or hierarchies, but rather as the combined use of markets and hierarchies. With high part incentive and the absence of administrative involvement, the parties to market mediated exchange will negotiate the initial contract in a hard-headed way. Each will appropriate the stream of net receipts that accrues to it from autonomous adaptation during the execution of the contract and either party can appeal disputes to the courts, which in turn will apply the appropriate legal rules to award money damages. This is shown in the upper panel of figure 1 as market mediated exchange. However, coordinated adaptation under hierarchy as shown in the lower panel of figure 1 is promoted by unified ownership of the two stages coupled with creation of a new actor, the interface coordinator to which each stage reports and receives administrative direction and control. Consequential disturbances that would give rise to poor coordination are dealt with the interface coordinator who has ultimate responsibility for coordinated responses and internal disputes between stages and likewise settled by the interface coordinator with reference to mutual gain, that is private ordering. Efficiency. According to TCT adaptations of both kinds discussed here are undertaken in the service of efficiency. Tedelis and Williamson's have opined that the choice among alternative modes of governance mainly has a purpose of economizing on transaction cost. Although TC claims that non-standard and unfamiliar contracting practices mainly operate in the service of efficiency, other purposes of which market dominance that is monopoly is one are sometimes responsible for puzzling practices. The governance model. Building upon Tedelis, Tedelis and Williamson construct a model of contractual choice which is explained in this section. This model contributes by exposing complementarities between cost incentives and governance that helps clarify the underpinnings of TCE framework. The model assumes that adaptation costs are incurred only by the buyer and asset specificity is treated as a probability of finding an alternative seller without incurring adaptation cost rather than as an actual loss and surplus in the seller is replaced. Transaction and Governance Let us assume that in a given transaction a buyer achieves value V greater than 0 if it procures a good or service from a supplier and successfully incorporates it into its own output. The transaction is characterized by the degree of asset specificity and contractual incompleteness. The measures of asset specificity Consider that asset specificity can manifest itself in several ways which are physical, human, site dedicated assets and brand name capital. Asset specificity can arise in two ways. One is from purposeful investments 
and another is spontaneously whether the latter take the form of knowledge and skill that are incidentally acquired by the parties while working together. These assets, whatever may be the form, cannot be redeployed to the alternative uses and users without some loss of productive value. The asset specificity is modeled by sigma which belongs to 0 and 1, where higher value of sigma represent higher degrees of asset specificity. Here sigma can be interpreted technically as the probability that the supplier cannot be replaced by a competitor when disturbances occur and adaptation cost will be incurred. The probability 1 minus sigma indicates that there exists an alternative supplier who will compete to perform any adaptations that are needed and adaptation cost will be avoided. In view of this, Dudley's and Williamson argued that though more asset specificity does imply that more value is lost when an alternative supplier is used from an ex ante perspective, the probabilistic nature of measure of asset specificity is equivalent that is when sigma is higher, the expected loss from having to switch suppliers will be larger, making the fundamental transformation more sphere. Complexity and incomplete contracts. Let us assume term as the probability that the contract will adequately cover ex post needs. Thus, contractual completeness that can be modeled by tau belongs to closed interval 0 and 1. Now that probability 1 minus tau, a significant disturbance or contingency occurs at which point the contract's ex ante design will fail to achieve the value V. In this event, the ex post adaptation at some extra cost will be needed to achieve V. Here, for simplicity, Tedelis and Williamson keep V constant so that any loss from adaptation is captured by adaptation cost. Bajri and Tedelis consider a model where it is possible to invest more or less resources in design ex ante making design that is contractual completeness an exogenous variable that responds to project complexity. They show that more complex projects have endogeneously chosen contracts that are more incomplete. Hence, we treat 1 minus term as exogenous and interpret it as a contractual incompleteness of transaction. Market and hierarchies. Tedelis and Williamson have considered two modes of governance such as market and hierarchy. TCE identifies both markets and hierarchy with two features each opposite to each other as reported in table 2. Tedesi and Williamson proceed to formally define market versus hierarchy using only one of these attributes, the assignment of administrative control over production and adaptation process. They define market governance M to be the choice in which the parties retain autonomy over their own production process decisions. And the supplier is expected to deliver a product that meets the contractual specifications. Any adaptation to adjust the ex ante design due to disturbances needs to be renegotiated by the autonomous parties. Tedelis and Williamson assume here that adaptation will be required only for the supplier's production phase of the project. The buyer now may have to adapt the process under its control to accommodate some disturbances as well. Now let us define hierarchy H to be the choice in which the parties relinquish administrative control to a third party, the interface coordinator. This means that routine tasks are followed as planned, but when disturbances arise, then decisions are made by the interface coordinator who possesses unified ownership and control over production and adaptation for both stages of buyer and supplier. The notion of hierarchy as unified control and coordinated adaptation differs from a directional integration argument of whether the buyer integrates the supplier into business and becomes the interface coordinator or the reverse. 
In contrast, the notion of integration assigns responsibility for implementing routines to the managers of each stage, whereas disturbances for which coordinated adaptations are required are done at the direction of the interface coordinator as represented in figure 1. In a market transaction, each party controls their own processes. Thus, consent between buyer and supplier are needed for any adaptation. In TCT, this interface coordinator is a third party whose incentives are aligned with total profit maximization. That is instead of a pre-existing buyer and supplier. The transaction is a de novo investment whose governance needs to be determined. Efficiency considerations will determine whether the transaction is integrated that is controlled by an interface coordinator or if it is not integrated that is controlled by the contract and mutually agreed upon adaptations. Property rights theory or PRT in contrast identifies integration with a situation in which one of the two parties become the owner of all productive assets, controls the decisions related to their use. The predictions of PRT are as much about which of the two parties maintains control as about when unified ownership is called for. Apart from the allocation of administrative control, a compensation scheme that the buyer or interface coordinator uses to compensate the supplier must also be chosen as part of the inter-firm contract or intra-firm compensation scheme. As a result, this will influence the supplier's incentives to reduce cost. Now let us denote the supplier's production cost by C, which includes material and other expenses such as lost opportunities, possibly the wages of labor under this direction, etc. Let us restrict it to linear compensation schemes that have a fixed component F and a share of production cost that is 1 minus Z which belongs to 0 and 1. A supplier that incurs cost C is paid F plus 1 minus Z into C, where Z belongs to 0 and 1 is the share of production cost that are borne by the supplier often referred to as strength of the cost incentives that the supplier faces. For instance, if Z is equal to 1 and F is greater than 0, then the supplier receives a fixed price payment of F and bears all the production cost which seem to be the norm for almost all market transactions. Here, in this case, the supplier has very strong incentives to find ways to reduce production cost. However, if Z is equal to 0 and F is greater than 0, then a cost plus contract is in place where the supplier receives some fixed compensation F and bears none of the production cost C, which seems to be the case for most hierarchical structures. Further, with a cost plus contract, the supplier has no gain from engaging in activities that reduce production cost. Production cost. Let us assume that supplier's production cost are given by the function C, E and G, where E is greater than or equal to 0 is the effort intensity that the supplier puts into the project and G which belongs to M and H denotes the mode of governance. Rising effort intensity leads to low production cost. This can be the extra time and attention that the supplier puts into directing production of other employees into choosing production alternatives that reduce cost, etc. The cost of effort to the supplier is given by a convex increasing function that is YE. Decisions on how to produce or adapt the production processes can be thought of as an input into production process. The definition of markets state that if the supplier has complete control of its production process, then the ability to control all the inputs, including effort and decisions, should make the supplier more effective in cutting cost. Similarly, the definition of hierarchy states that if decisions are in the hands of the interface coordinator, then the supplier's lack of autonomy 
will make its efforts less effective. Now it is assumed that supplier effort is more effective in the market governance. Thus, the derivative of CEM with respect to E is less than the derivative of CEH with respect to E, which is less than equal to zero. Here, the assumption one is an assumption about a marginal reaction, namely the effect of the allocation of administrative control on the slope of the cost function with respect to effort. The level of production cost ought to be lower than the supplier retains control, that is CEM, which is less than equal to CEH. When the supplier exerts no effort, then the allocation of administrative control does not matter. That is C0M is equal to C0H. In this case, assumption 1 implies that CEM is less than CEH for all E is greater than 0. Adaptation cost. Economic problems arise due to disturbances and economic organizations have to adopt such kind of disturbances quickly. If a disturbance occurs, then above and beyond the production cost, that is CEG, costly adaptations must be made to obtain the value V. Adaptation cost can have at least two sources such as the previous activities, haggling, rent seeking and other renegotiation cost. The previous activities. The first source of adaptation cost is from previous activities and can be imposed by having such previous activities wasted and redone or having to modify initially planned production processes that fit the original design. These adaptation costs stem from contractual incompleteness. Further, these adaptation costs could have been spared if a complete contract and accurate designs were in place. Haggling rent seeking and other renegotiation cost. The second source of adaptation cost will be a result of haggling, rent seeking and other renegotiation cost that parties expand in order to get a better deal. These activities are a source of dead weight loss that does not affect equilibrium outcomes. There is some uncertainty as to which of these two sources of adaptation cost are more or less severe and thus be aggregated both has total adaptation cost which is denoted by KZG which is greater than zero. Adaptation cost and occurrence of events. Adaptation cost that is KZG are incurred if following two events happen. First, a disturbance must happen which occurs with probability 1 minus T, the incompleteness of the contract. Second, a new supplier from the competitive market cannot do the work which occurs with probability sigma, the measure of specificity. Because if the needed adaptation is not very specific, then it would be more likely that other suppliers can compete for adaptation that needs to be done and no loss from haggling will occur. It is again assumed here that adaptation costs are borne only by the buyer. The supplier can also bear some adaptation cost which would add symmetry to the problem of adaptation without changing the qualitative results. It is also assumed here that adaptation costs are worth incurring so that when adaptation is needed the buyer's gross benefit is given by V minus K which is function of Z and G greater than 0. Hence the expected gross benefit is given by V minus 1 minus T into sigma K greater than 0. The expected adaptation costs are increasing in both contractual incompleteness that is 1 minus T and asset specificity that is sigma. According to Tedley's and Williamson adaptation costs are lower in hierarchy that is KZM is greater than KZH for all Zs. The intuition behind assumption 2 is supported by the micro foundation of the hold up problem. The most specific assets of any kind are concentrated under an independent supply stage. The worst is the fundamental transformation. When the supplier holds the dedicated assets, then the temporal lock-in is stronger 
because the aggregate degree of bilateral dependency has increased. The Dalys and Williamson here argue that the choice of incentives will affect adaptation cost. Williamson proposed that low part incentives have well known adaptability advantages. If the supplier bears less of the production cost, when it has less to gain from engaging in negotiations with the buyer or interface coordinator who is requesting some adaptation. Thus adaptation costs are lower when cost incentives are weaker. That is DKZG divided by DZ is greater than 0. As per this assumption, under any ownership structure whatsoever, the incentive intensity goes up. The insistence on compensation by the supply side will impose higher adaptation cost. Tedley's and Williamson also formally assume that reducing adaptation cost by weakening incentives is more effective under hierarchy. That is, DKZH upon DZ is greater than DKZM upon DZ which is greater than 0. In TCT's metric approach to adaptation assumes that the supplier never initiates a need for adaptation. Here Tedley's and Williamson assume that when adaptation happens the supplier utility is not affected. The supplier is exactly compensated for any extra cost that adaptation imposes on him. As such, adaptation causes extra cost and inefficiencies that are imposed on the buyer or the interface coordinator, but no extra rents are gained or lost by the supplier. Selective intervention. Now it is important to make explicit what has been so far implicit. The choice of governance structure affects both production cost that is CEG and the adaptation cost that is KZG. According to Tedelis and Williamson, assumption 1 through 4 imply that supplier autonomy defined by market governance reduces production cost but increases adaptation cost while hierarchy does the opposite. They further argued that there is perhaps an obvious solution let the supplier retain control of production decisions related to the original design and let the interface coordinator or possibly the buyer retain control over adaptation decisions. However, this is ruled out by the assumption that selective intervention is severely limited. According to Tedelis and Williamson, the model takes an extreme position on the inability to have selective intervention. But clearly, what matters is that at the margin, some selective intervention is impossible. Market versus hierarchies, governance and incentives. Let us first consider the objective of the supplier, which is to maximize U E Z G, which is equal to F minus Z C E G minus Y E. According to Tedelis and Williamson, the assumptions on C and Y imply that the supplier's optimal choice E star increasing in Z that E star is equal to 0 without incentives there is no effort. And for any Z belonging to 0 and 1, assumption 1 implies that E star ZM is greater than E star ZH which is greater than 0. That is effort is higher when the supplier controls production through market governance. Given the optimal response of the supplier, surplus maximization according to Tedelis and Williamson is given by the following equation. That is maximize U which is equal to V minus C into E Z G into G minus Y into E star Z G minus sigma into 1 minus T into K Z G where total transaction cost is V minus C E star Z G and G minus Y E star Z G minus sigma 1 minus T into K Z G. Production cost and compensations are V minus C E star Z G and G minus Y into E star Z G. Expected adaptation cost is equal to minus sigma into 1 minus T K Z G. Thus according to Tedelis and Williamson, when asset specificity increases, that is sigma is higher or when contracts are more incomplete, 
transactions are more complex, the lower T, the relative benefits of hierarchy over markets increase. Furthermore, optimal incentives become weaker. In reference to figure 2, the Dalys and Williamson argued that as contractual incompleteness increases, total transaction cost increase for both markets and hierarchies, causing both functions to rise. However, market transaction cost increase faster, making hierarchies better for a larger range of specificity sigma. This is a point that the model illuminates. Since sigma and 1 minus t are multiplied, contractual incompleteness and asset specificity are complementary. This in turn implies that the negative effects that incompleteness has on adaptation cost are exacerbated when asset specificity is higher. Now let us summarize what we have learned from this module. The transaction cost theory or the transaction cost economics that has been facilitating the firms in analysis and examination of a number of strategic and organizational issues. The TCT has helped a lot to strategic management in providing support of explanation of how firms internationalize the transaction cost. The firms can internalize transaction cost of production of goods and services in order to deliver a product. Hierarchical organizations such as companies represent alternative governance structure which differ in their approaches to resolving conflicts of interest. TCT is based upon several key assumptions about human behavior and environmental characteristics. In order to minimize transaction and production cost, the firm will select the governance form from the various alternatives available in the organizational menu. Ronald Coase first observed the transaction cost in 1937 that arise when transaction costs are conducted through the market and he advocated that internalizing the transactions optimizes the relative value of the exchange. There are though transaction costs related to internalization, they are relatively lower relative to those which helps the exchanges in the market. Although Coase in his work explained why economic activity was organized within firms, since the works of Williamson, the TCT has moved to concerns with issues such as appropriation, ownership, alignment of incentives and self-interest, which make it a general and universally acceptable theory. Many transactions, according to Williamson and Tadelis, require parties to engage in a relationship over which ongoing interaction is needed to complete the transaction. Ken Thero, however, opined that the cost of operating competitive markets are not zero, as is usually assumed in arithmetical analysis. Williamson and Tadelis have introduced the governance model of TCT, which contributes by exposing complementarities between cost incentives and governance that helps clarify the underpinnings of TCT framework.